What I'd like to do tonight is talk about what happens when light itself becomes a medium in art. I think traditionally, when you, you speak about light and art, you might imagine a painter who's particularly gifted at depicting light in a naturalistic way. And the first person that most art historians will jump to is Johannes Vermeer. He's a 17th century Dutch painter who was really admired for his renderings of domestic settings that featured an extraordinary sensitivity to light effects. This is a painting called The Music Lesson from 1662. And in it, light serves many different functions. It illuminates the space, it creates depth in and around all objects, and it allows details such as the extraordinary details in the tapestry to be seen and visible. But most importantly, it also sets a mood. It creates a warm glow that suggests the intimacy and the familiarity of a domestic setting. Another example is Michelangelo Caravaggio, an Italian artist who worked roughly around the same time, a little bit earlier. And he was interested in creating what he believed would be a more realistic, that is a less idealized composition that used light. This is probably one of his most important paintings called Calling of St. Matthew. It's from roughly 1600. It's in a, a chapel in a, in a beautiful church in Rome. And it depicts the moment when Jesus inspires St. Matthew to follow him. And if you look at the composition, you can see that it's set in a dark, mundane space occupied by a bunch of tax collectors. And Christ is the source of divine light and, and, and knowledge and wisdom. But what's remarkable about this painting is that it hangs in a chapel under a window where if you're there at exactly the right time of day, the light will stream across the painting in the exact place that Car Caravaggio placed it. So light becomes the material that unites the pictorial with the architectural. Now, in the 20th century, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, artists began to challenge the very definition of what art could be. And light itself, rather than being represented or depicted, actually became the material or the medium of the light. So what I'd like to do is run through a few works from the Hirshhorn's collection, some of which are on view now, and talk about some of the challenges that they, they present to us. Uh, as JD said, I'm organizing a major exhibition with Robert Irwin, so I'm going to do a plug by showing one of my favorite pieces from our collection. This is an untitled disc from 1969 by Irwin. It's an acrylic disc. It's probably about five feet across, sprayed with white acrylic paint, and there's this beautiful warm silvery band across it. But what makes it so important is he uses four standard light fixtures to cast these overlapping shadows onto the disc. The, the result or the effect is the edges dissipate, so it makes it all but impossible to determine where the work of art ends and where the surrounding space begins. But what's really significant about this work is he gives immaterial form, shadows, a material or an active role. Without the shadows, there is no artwork. It's not complete. And he, so he uses light to create a purely phenomenological encounter that's entirely devoid of narrative, so we've moved so far away from Vermeer. This is another great piece in our collection that I put up a few years ago. It's called Milk Run. It's by James Terrell, another California artist. It is this amazing, immersive piece that in order to enter it, you have to walk down this pitch dark corridor, which actually serves as a light lock. So it becomes this kind of labyrinth in space. And you sit in a pitch black room, if you can find the bench. And it's only with time, if you have the patience, and many people don't, they just walk right out. If you sit there for a little while, gradually you'll see these colors, red, pink, yellow, and purple, that begin to glow from across the space. If you sit there even longer, what you'll see is they begin to coalesce into this wedge-like form, and it begins to suggest walls or barriers. And in fact, if you sit there long enough, the entire space begins to feel like it's going to cleave. But what I think is most remarkable about this is it's made with a few fluorescent bulbs and a few theatrical gels. If you really knew how simple this was, I mean, the space itself is pretty complex, but it is using just the most basic technology and things that you can find commercially. So, the thing is, is artists like Irwin and Terrell use commercially available t um, bulbs, technology, all sorts of different sources of light. But what they do is they present an array of challenges and, and kind of conditions that, that those of us who work in museums have to grapple with daily, because it's our job to preserve these artworks and ensure that they can be seen by future generations. But at the same time, it's always important in my world to maintain the artistic integrity of the work itself. So we're always trying to balance those two. So this is a piece by Dan Flavin, which is currently on view in the Hirshhorn in the lower level. It's an untitled piece from 1974. 
Flavin was a remarkable artist who decided to use readily available fluorescent bulbs to create artworks that really, they, what they do is, in this case, is they really aggressively flood the gallery with light so that the entire gallery and everybody and everything in it becomes part of the work of art. So this is the piece that's on view at the Hirschhorn. And what Flavin said is that the piece is site conditioned. That means it changes every time you install it depending on the space. So it always goes from the left hand of door or the right hand door from the door and it extends until it hits a wall. So right now it's about 80 feet long if you can imagine that using fluorescent bulbs. And it creates a lot of challenges. First of all, the electricity. We have to build a closet somewhere nearby that'll, that'll hold a new electrical panel. And of course, for us, it's always about the visual effect. So you don't want to have a closet sitting in the middle of the room. So where do you put the closet? And then, of course, the bulbs burn out. And they burn out quickly, we found. And at the Hirschhorn, we're open 364 days a year. Most art museums are open five, maybe six days a week. And so for us, we don't have that day every week to fix everything. It also means that everything is on nine hours a day, seven days a week, except for Christmas. For Flavin, the core element of his practice was using these readily available off-the-shelf fluorescent bulbs. But this was made in 1974. And with time, the precise colors of off-the-shelf bulbs were no longer available. So it creates a lot of questions for us. What's important? Is the exact quality of the light important? Or is it the fact that it can be purchased commercially? And is it the aesthetic? Or is it the concept? And how do you codify light beyond the basic spectrum? It's an experience. And the thing about the Flavin is it's an absolutely subjective experience. So as a rule, we always start with the artist. Or in the case with someone like Flavin, who died about a decade ago, we work with the estate. And the estate has grappled with this issue for many years. And they finally came to a conclusion after much consideration and consulting with museum curators, scholars, art historians. They decided that the color itself should take precedence. And not everybody agrees with them. And so when we want to install this piece and we want to make sure that we have enough bulbs to ensure that the entire thing will be lit up for the run of the exhibition, we actually go through the estate to order bulbs that are specially made. And we and all of the other museums and collectors who have these works, for the, especially the ones that are the colors that are no longer available have to go through the estate. It, there's an obvious irony to this. And one wonders how Flavin would feel about this. And I think it's, it points to the fact that what we do is an evolving dialogue. There is no right answer. It's not science. And it's also becoming increasingly challenging, because when you think about it, there's going to be a day in, sometime soon where you can't buy fluorescent bulbs at all. They simply aren't manufactured. So the question is, what are we going to do? Time-based media, particularly film, presents um, another array of challenges. Uh, this is a piece by Paul Scherer. It's called Shutter Interface from 1975. And it is four 16 millimeter projectors that project overlapping bands of color. And they are accompanied by this fabulous high-pitched soundtrack. And if you'll play about 10 seconds of it, you'll give it a sense of the piece. <laughs> The most immediate problem for us is the hardware. 16 millimeter film projectors, loopers, and parts and bulbs are increasingly difficult to find and repair. I think I heard the other day from one of our staff members that there's this one guy in Europe who still fixes loopers. But otherwise, there's no one who fixes these. And as I said, we're open 364 days a year. And I put this on view a few years ago, and it was up for about four months. That's a lot of film prints and a lot of running these projectors. Also, color film fades over time. What were the original colors of this installation if it first was shown in 1975? How accurate are the film prints that we're using today? And Sheritz died in 1993, and frankly, he was a lot more important and popular now than he was then. And he doesn't really have an estate that thought about these ideas when he died. So we can't go to the artist. So with film, the obvious choice is to switch formats and go to video. But with the Sheritz, the experience of standing in the room with these projectors and the sound of the projectors and this kind of which you kind of got a sense of. And it's also this immersive effect. I mean, the projectors are part of the work of art. It seems like the projection itself is the art, but it's the entire immersive experience. And this is all an effect of the technology. And it would be lost if we simply just put them on silent projectors and tried to imitate the sound of, of, of a, of a uh, projector. So we're very wary of shifting the format. But it means we're also very wary of putting the work on view, because we know one day they're going to break, and we're not going to be able to put them up again. So the question is, is there going to be a point one day when we can no longer show this work as a work by Paul Sheritz? And who makes that decision? And how should that decide, how should that influence our future acquisitions? 
Even a piece as, simply, sim, as seemingly simple as uh, Giam, Giam, excuse me, Giovanni Anselmo's Invisible from 1971. It's a great piece, again, on view on the third floor right now, where it is um, a, just a basic slide projector that looks like it's just sitting there until you walk by it, where, and it will project the word invisible or invisible onto whatever happens to be in front of it. Seems pretty straightforward, but no. Is how essential is the mechanism of the slide projector for the piece? How would the work change if we shifted the slide projector to a digital video projector? Is the hum a, proje a projector a part of the part? What about the bulb? Would a digital projector create the same effect of an artwork that only appears when you, you walk past it into the cone of light? So museums, as we're collecting and showing these works, are increasingly becoming more proactive. The Hirshhorn is one of only many modern and contemporary art museums who are struggling with these issues. And at the Hirshhorn now, before we even agree to acquire a work of art, every department in the museum, the exhibit staff, the conservators, the registrars, the curators, of course, all have the opportunity to ask questions of the dealer or the artist so that we can think about what are the kind of problems that we might, we might encounter. And once we, encounter, once we agree to purchase the work, we write a contract, and increasingly we are very specific talking about what kind of latitude we can take and how we can change the formats and who we might have to ask if we want to do that. So I'll talk more about a success story because I've only talked about kind of questions. This is another piece that's on view. It's a piece called Cloud by Spencer Finch. Um, and it's this wonderful piece. If you can see, it's a series of lights, and each one is comprising three parts, two large pieces, one small piece. It's H2O. So the piece is cloud. So it's in thinking about how you can represent the idea of something natural in purely technological terms. And um, my co-curator of At the Hub of Things, Melissa, Chu, Melissa Ho, and I really wanted to install this piece. We had acquired it in 2000 and shown it immediately in the second floor galleries, but it was much smaller. So in the lobby gallery, especially as you're coming up the escalator, it, it was going to be like this little teeny piece kind of in the corner of the gallery, but we wanted it to be, have a much more powerful effect. So we went back to Spencer and we brought him to the Hirshhorn and we said, hey, can we possibly change this? And what Spencer ended up doing was configuring it in such a way that we acquired 30% more bulbs and a new framing structure. So now when you come to the Hirshhorn and you take the escalators up to the third floor, all you see when you're coming up the escalators is essentially this piece. And it's, it's this really kind of magical, immersive, and ethereal effect. And importantly, during installation when Spencer was here, we did interviews with him. And that's something we try to do now at the Hirshhorn. Every time we have an artist in the building and we own a work of art by that artist, we interview them with a curator and a conservator, and we do it on film. Because the idea is to ask these questions that we, you know, and try to get the answers. And if they don't even have the answers at that point, it's to get them to think about it. Because artists are always, aren't always thinking about what will happen to their work in 50 years. In Spencer's case, one of the things we're concerned about is the bulb technology. You can't really see it in this one, but um, each of the lights has a film in it. So one of the questions we ask is, what's more important, the warm tone of the, of the, or the quality of the light or actually the film in itself? What are we going to do when we can't source these bulbs that we have stockpiled them like we do with all of our light pieces? And this is, again, something we're trying to do with all artists. So what I'd like you to take away is that Artists opened up the possibility that art can be made of anything, even something as ephemeral and immaterial as art. But it's our job as museum professionals to really ensure the longevity and the conceptual in integrity of these artworks. And as I said, it's ultimately an ongoing, evolving process. There isn't an answer, yes or no. So we're hopeful that we continue to show these works and then preserve them for future generations. Thank you. Thank you.